always good to get together and sing praises to God. Uh, just, just look forward to having a lot more time on our schedule in eternity to just, just keep doing that, right? Uh, it'd be a great, great day to, to be in God's presence and sing together. I, I did want to say, because I was looking around, we have several folks visiting, uh, of course, uh, as far away as India, which is great. Uh, we had Austin, Texas, saw you guys out here. It was great to have you with us. Um, Kentucky is represented. California is represented. I know everybody's thinking, oh, Texas and California and Colorado, duh. But uh, it's nice to have visitors, and that's great. Uh, and then, of course, some friends from Arkansas now more recently. So that's really good to see all of you here. Welcome. Uh, we're really happy for your presence. Something just for, for the church family here to know. I know when we carried the baptistry in Wednesday, a lot of you thought we'd be putting it on the other side of the wall, but uh, this just kind of works. You know, why, why hide your light under a bushel is kind of the idea. Uh, no, there, there's one more lift day coming up Wednesday night, and so you want to you be here Wednesday. The platform's getting done, and we're going we're gonna to try to sneak that thing through that window. And so um, all of your... Uh, Patience as well as strength is required Wednesday night, man, if you want to help out with that. Okay, uh, one thing I do want to say coming up for us uh, really quickly now, June 10th through 12th, is our youth weekend we're going to be doing. B.J. Sipe from uh, Kentucky will be helping us out with that. Put that on your calendar. Come for the singing. And then I'd like to next Sunday after services have one more kind of get together with some of our teachers, um, those who are helping out, make sure we're, we're getting all of our bases covered. And then again, it was kind of said in some of our thoughts today, what a joy it is to assemble. In fact, Ed, you, you said a little bit about this, how good this is to be together. And yet the reminder is this is about taking it out to the world. And so remember, we're gathered in God's name to scatter. And so, so it's just hope that you're encouraged by God's word and you have something to share with your neighbor as we go. And then let's get into our series again today. We started Joseph last week. And we're going we're gonna to continue to take on this patriarch from the book of origins uh, as we do. I want to remind you that last week we, we ended with him being thrown into a pit uh, with the reminder that when life is the pits, you look up. God's always there. And Joseph seems to be this surprise in the Bible because every time we think he should think God's forgotten him, he just keeps holding on. He has this faith that won't let go of God. Now, we found him in the pit, and the plot from the brothers was, let's kill him. Uh, they, of course, realized they could make a little money instead, and so they sell him. Uh, and, and that's where we left him, headed to Egypt. I, I wanted to bring this up because I find this interesting. Joseph's life story takes up over a quarter of the book of Genesis. It's 13 chapters of that one book cover this one individual's life. But of those 13 chapters, 12 of them cover his life in Egypt, which I find really interesting. You see, what, what we see here is the real test in Joseph's uh, faith is integrity. Will he be able to hold on to a faith in God in a foreign pagan land as he did in his homeland? And so we'll see this set up throughout the rest of his story here. You see, in Egypt, he's a foreigner, he's a stranger, and his faith could not be any stranger to the people whose land he is in. And now, this is something you've all witnessed about human nature, by the way. Those people whose character, whose integrity, whose ethics seem to shift with every new situation or circumstance they find them in. Well, well that's, that's a reality in, in life, actually. We don't, we don't always do this. Sometimes you have, but you see it, that, that whatever it is that's going on around you starts to mold or shape and actually devalue some of those traits that you ought to have. That's what makes this command to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind such an all-important command. God doesn't want a part of you. He doesn't want just your work life or your family life or your church life. God wants all of you. And so the way I'd like to paint this today as we look at integrity is to live an integrated life. All the pieces that make up who we are. I, I want to be focused in on God. That's what real integrity is about. And so while situations can devalue certain values, when we are fully tested like Joseph, we're being tested in our integrity. Are we living fully integrated lives with God? Or are we holding something back is the idea. Are there some people, places, or things that tempt us to change our convictions? To live, well, if integration is what we're talking about toward God, the opposite would be disintegrated lives. And frankly, that's what it looks like when you see it played out. Now, this, I believe, 
is what is the greatest threat our culture is facing today, the greatest crisis. I know I sound like you just turned on the news because it's crisis, 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 but I just want to get it straight. There is a crisis, and I don't believe that the greatest crisis is, is, is the crisis uh, of maybe a financial collapse or energy crisis or climate crisis, but rather I believe the greatest crisis our culture is facing is the collapse of real character. Integrated living is just disintegrating around us. In fact, one of the greatest lessons this Bible character teaches us is what Bible character ought to look like. And I don't want anyone here to be surprised. When it comes to integrity, when it comes to real character, it will always be tested by crisis. And so I want to jump back into our story. Joseph uh, was betrayed by his brothers. Of course, we uh, kind of highlighted in our text last week that they hated him. They hated him because he was their father's favorite. They hated him because he told on them, which, by the way, just revealed their character. And finally, they hated him because he had this dream. And the dream of Joseph ruling over them was just a nightmare. And so these brothers decide they're going to do everything they can to get around the plan of God. And so they sell him as a slave. And the Bible says in Genesis 39, and this is where most of our texts will come from today. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the, the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Now, now this is where, for Joseph at least, the test is going to be set. We know that while at home, Joseph had this hang-on kind of faith. He had integrity there in Canaan. But will he hold on when in Egypt? I mean, there's a major shift here in his life, right? The location is completely different. The pressures are different. The environment is different. Will his faith remain completely integrated to God, or will it prove malleable, altered by external forces? You see, in Egypt, Joseph is tested in absolutely every way. He's in a brand new culture. Uh, he, he's around and, and surrounded by a brand new religious orientation. He has a new status and often lack of status that comes and goes with Joseph. He's introduced to a new language and new interactions with people. I mean, this is a real test of who he really is. And don't forget, he had just 17 years to set who he really was. But for those 17 years for Joseph, there was one religion and one God. It was the faith that his great-grandfather, Abraham, had passed on. But in Egypt, he's introduced to this plethora of gods. There's gods all around, and he's told repeatedly, this is the normal way people worship. In fact, for you to have only one God is not only not normal, it's not religious because you don't even have something to bow down to. And so he's made to sense what's going on here is different. Who will he be? But remember, a person of integrity will not allow their shifting environment to alter their commitments. In fact, when our culture shifts around us, when our environment changes, when circumstances get difficult for the Christian, it should only highlight for us those values that we refuse to give up on. And certainly that's the case with Joseph. The truth is that our circumstances do not determine who we are. They simply reveal who we are. That is, our true character will be tested. And when it is tested, what finds out is it, what we find out is we reveal what was underneath there to begin with. I've, I've always used this illustration. I know I've probably used it here too many times. But I love the idea of that little tea bag. You can't see what flavor it is, you know. It, you, but you put it in hot water and you can figure it out. And the truth is that's what Christians are like. Our character is revealed when things get hot, when, when we're in crisis, when there's trouble. What's in us comes to the surface. Uh, and so life's more difficult circumstances do not make you lack integrity. They reveal whether that integrity existed. And for a long time, God speaks about this in his scripture. First Chronicles 29, verse 17, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. You see, the truth about any test, and I know finals is coming up pretty soon. This is a hard reality. The truth about any test is some people will fail. The truth about the integrity test is some will fail. And some will pass. You see, integrity is the key idea here. Where every facet of our life is now integrated or united with the will of God. 
And the question is, will you hold on to that? Or will you have multiple allegiances? Be one thing one place, another in another. Living a disintegrated life. You see, the truth is all along, God is testing us in this. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? You see, God is looking for consistency in our faith, for integrity in every area of our life to keep us from being disintegrated or fractioned in our life. In fact, uh, just pre-finals exam for all you math students up here. Uh, have any of you learned what an integer is here? I, don't, I love when I get to give a math test. I never thought this would happen in my life. An integer is just a whole number. That, that comes from the same root that we get our integrity. It is whole or in otherwise it's not fractioned. It's not many different things. It's just one complete thing and God's looking for that in his people. They're the whole person. They're not two-faced. They're not phony. They're not pretenders. They're not this way, this place, and this way in another. And the truth is we have this great role model in Jesus who was always completely integrated with God. In fact, Jesus was so consistent in his faith, I absolutely love this, that his enemies knew if we're going to trip Jesus up, it has to be surrounding something around his integrity. You see, that, that's, a, that's a tough kind of mind play there. But what they realized is we got to find a situation where his integrity will not allow him to waffle in his beliefs or to be someone different than he's claimed to be. And here's one of those times where they test him based on his consistency. They come to him and say, teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Now, this is more than them buttering him up. They then ask him a very difficult question, a loaded question about taxes. But what's interesting in the whole scheme of it is they knew integrity is the one place we've got to find a fault in him. Now, now, here's my question about that. How would your enemies tempt you? Would you be so consistently consistent, so full of integrity, they thought, this is where we got to trap them? This is what we need to look for in our life, that kind of integrity. Shifting circumstances do not change the values of people with integrity. And so the wise man says, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. It's such a great word picture, right? The man with integrity, the person of integrity, doesn't have to keep worrying that the life I'm living here is going to catch up to the life I'm living here. And the people who think I'm this are going to find out I'm really this. They are the same person. They are a whole person. They walk securely because no matter where they go, they're the same. And the Joseph of Canaan is going to prove to be the same Joseph in Egypt because whether everyone can see him or the door's shut and no one's around, Joseph lived an integrated life. In just one area he did that, we see an integrated work ethic from Joseph here. Look at your Bibles again, chapter 39. I'll start up at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. And again, just underline that. Last week we underlined they hated him. That kept coming up. Underline the Lord was with him. In this section of Joseph's life, this keeps coming up. And I think the writer's reminding us that you're going to keep running into places where you think God must have abandoned this character. But the character of Joseph remembers that, no, the Lord is with me. This is why he does what he does. And so the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate, which tells you how important food is to all of us. But really, this guy only had to think about what was for dinner. Joseph was over everything. And this is what I, I see about work ethic here. Joseph was a servant, not by choice, by force. And Joseph did not let being a, ser a servant lead him to slacking off. 
His integrity was too great to settle for mediocrity. I, I love it. this. Just think about this. Joseph wasn't sitting there saying, hey, they might be able to make me work, but they're going to get the least effort out of me. And boy, that isn't a cultural slam in our faces right there. Well, they may pay my check, but they don't pay me enough. They're not going to get this out of me. Joseph never shows that attitude. You don't have to keep a constant eye on workers who have integrity. They're going to keep working even when you're not looking. It's the same output. It's the same effort. They don't work one way while you're watching and then slack off when you're not. And it, for personal example, it's hard to use myself for not work ethic, but uh, I, I've, I've gone a couple times to little places where personal trainers are trying to work out a group, and I've fallen into this. If they're looking, I am working harder than anyone in the room, but I cannot wait for them to look away because I'm going to take a break. And let's just face it, that's in all our human nature, and Joseph battles that even when his job is not the one he wanted. People who have integrated lives are industrious people, no matter what they're doing. They're hard workers, they're careful workers, they're quality workers, and they ultimately are working because they hope to be a blessing to others. Now ask, why, why would Joseph carry this in to Egypt? Joseph understood that while he was forced to be Potiphar's servant, he wasn't merely Potiphar's servant. He was a servant of God. And folks, that is at the very heart of what the Bible teaches us about work ethic. Paul writing in Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do, that's a pretty good blanket statement. Whether in word or deed, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You don't phone it in at one job until you get the job of your dreams. You're thankful you have what you have, and you do it as unto the Lord. He goes on in verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. You see, because Joseph had an integrated work ethic, he would work just as hard for Potiphar as he had for Jacob. And you've got to admire somebody like that. When you think about the examples we have in the Bible, what about, what about Jesus? I know as soon as we talk about Jesus, we're thinking rabbi, right? Sitting around talking, talking to people about the gospel. Do you know, for over a decade, he was a businessman. He would have been running the affairs of a carpenter. He was in the business world. Now, can you imagine someone in that day saying of Jesus, well, he's, he's a nice guy, but his work's a little, he's cutting corners. I mean, I, I get it. I like him, but, you know, he's never once been able to keep a schedule. Every time I want something done, he's just always behind. Can you imagine something like that? Or the Apostle Paul, certainly we know he preached all over the world and started churches around the known world, but he was a tent maker by trade. Can you imagine someone saying of Paul's tents, it's leaky, the stitch work's bad. And Paul's saying, well, I don't really care who I'm working for, so. No, the man who wrote these words had a work ethic. And, and here's the thing behind it. He was hoping to be a blessing for others. Now, now, this is why I say this. Listen carefully. If, if all Christians not only nodded their head at this, but practiced it, my phone would be ringing off the hook. Businesses, corporations would be calling the Lord's church and saying, we want to hire people like your people here. Don't you think? Like, if we really bought into this, it would change the way we worked within this world. Look, if you're a follower of Jesus, your work ethic should never be called into question. And I want to say this, especially for this front row. That applies to home chores and homework. It's, it's what you have to do. You do it with all your heart, and you give thanks to the Lord as you give your best effort. When we have an integrated work ethic, the fact is others are blessed by it. You become a blessing to those around you, no matter what job you're doing. But here's the key. When you clock out of work, your integrity doesn't clock out with it. And so I'm reminded of a story Chuck Wendell told years ago uh, about a, a man uh, that, that he was aware of who had gone to a fried chicken place um, 
I, like, I don't know what it was. If it was KFC, I would say it. I just don't know. So he goes to this, this little fried chicken place, and he gets two dinners for he and the girl with him. Uh, and when they get to their picnic spot to eat their meal together, they find out inside this bag is not two chicken dinners, but a, just a stack of cash. And for whatever reason, the, the girl that was kind of emptying out the register had put the bag in the wrong place. So they came with the day's earnings of this business, over $1,000. Well, immediately, of course, he realized that's not chicken. He runs it back to the store, and, and the owner of the restaurant is just so overjoyed. He's like, thank you so much. You must be the most honest man in the state. Let me call the, the news. I want the local news to cover this. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. He goes, no, no, no. I've never met someone with this kind of integrity. Let's get the papers here. He said, no pictures. This, this woman's not my wife. <laughs> She's somebody else's. That is a disintegrated life. Honest, dishonest, not fully in tune to what's going on. It's a fractured life. And when you live a fully integrated life, circumstances do not alter your character. And Joseph is going to be the same person at work as he was behind closed doors. And you see this as the story continues in verses 6 through 12. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, the, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. And one day, he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. And you've got to see setup all over this. And she caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Now, if you keep reading here, she, she immediately shows her lack of integrity. Uh, she, she keeps um, calling him this Hebrew, uh, inferring about his religion and his ethnicity, right? He's beneath me. And the reality is she's been scorned, and she's enraged, and she's furious. And she says, this Hebrew made sport of me and tried to sleep with me, but I screamed, and he left his coat and ran. And I, I know we're going to read this, but I've just always thought, after everything had been blessed that he had, Potiphar kind of gets the truth here. I mean, he's angry. But he might be angry that he just lost the best thing he ever had. And that wasn't his wife. It was Joseph. But he's got to do what he's got to do. And he sends Joseph to be confined in the king's prison. All right, let's get back to the top of that passage we read. Only three people in all of the Old Testament are called handsome. I find that interesting. Uh, Another stat for another time, but it's, it's, uh, we all think we're more handsome than we are. I'll just leave it there. Uh, only three in the Old Testament. I don't think we've gotten a lot better looking. So uh, you got Joseph and David and Absalom. But, but why that detail? Why that fact? It seems a little interesting, right? I feel like the Bible is trying to show you, before you think Joseph is just this superhuman that doesn't have desires like we do, that he's just another man like all of us. He's your good-looking, real well-built, 20-something man, and he's got the same desires and the same needs that everybody else has. And so it puts it out there for us. And this woman, Mrs. Potiphar, proves another interesting point, and that is that the Bible, all the way back in Genesis, is teaching gender equality. She is proof that women can be just as depraved as men. And you see it here. Sin, lust, out-of-control desires. They affect men and women alike. But before we note Joseph's integrity, I just thought it'd be interesting to ask, did Joseph have any reasons to say yes to this? Let's just start with the one that comes up the most when I talk with people who've messed up their lives. Nobody's ever going to know. It'll never come out. That's, that's always the thought, right? And so Joseph might have worked through that idea. The other servants were not in the house. The master was gone. Think about this one. She certainly could have made his work life easier, right? He had been his father's favorite. He had got the advantage of being the favorite in one work situation. What if he becomes her favorite? 
certainly could have that kind of lifestyle back again. But probably what hits us all the most is what about his disappointment in God? What about a final bitterness that says, why am I even here? I'm, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not at home. I'm serving in someone else's house. This is happening day after day. You know, if God really cared, I wouldn't be in this situation in the first place. But listen, we are never out of excuses for diminishing our integrity. You need to know this. When you want to compromise your values, you will always find the excuse to do it. It'll be there. And Joseph has every excuse, every reason he could give. But what's better about Joseph is he had the right reasons to say no. And so start with that list. He was not going to abuse the trust of a man who put everything he had in his care. Not going to do it. Well, I wouldn't do something like that. And he was not going to betray what he knew to be the truth beyond the marriage commitment. Even if Mrs. Potiphar said, no, it's okay. In Egypt, we don't do it that way. You see, Joseph understood that when you have sex outside God's arrangement, you are defrauding someone else. He wouldn't do that to Potiphar. Wouldn't even do that to his wife. And he certainly was never going to do something like that to God. I will not dishonor God because even if in this culture it's acceptable, if two consenting adults are not hurting anybody else, Joseph knew if God does not consent, that's all I need to know. I know what's right, and I'm going to hold to that. Because, Christians, we don't take a poll when it comes to morality. What does the group think? What does our culture think? That's not the way this is settled. We look to God. We look for God's consent. Now, this story does have some irony in it in that the master's wife is enslaved to lust while her slave is free because of his integrity. And Joseph runs, proving again that if our strength is being numbered with God, then sometimes the best course is Exodus. And one more time, just note, Joseph loses another coat. Seems to be a habit at this point. While he keeps leaving coats behind, he is not willing to disrobe his integrity. You can see this integrated life. It doesn't guarantee peace. It doesn't guarantee safety or the job you want or the, the, the home you want. It's just not the way this works. And the book of Job is really a proof of this, right? You think about the devil's thesis or Satan's thesis in the book of Job. His idea is, look, God, the only way anybody's going to ever serve you is if you just give them good stuff. But dry up the good stuff and they'll give up on you. And God actually argues against that. God says, no, 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 I believe. I am good. And when people know that I am good, I'm all the good they're going to need, even if bad things come into their life. You know, Job's integrity was tested by crisis. He lost everything. And what God saw in Job in the beginning becomes true of Job in the end. The Lord said to Satan, I pray to God this never happens with my name in there. Like just don't, don't put me up at this. This is tough. But the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incite me against him to ruin him without any reason. Changing the circumstances did not alter the integrity of Job. And it didn't of Joseph either. Joseph lost his job. He lost his reputation, even lost his freedom. But he held on to his integrity. Every day, by the way, we are faced with a decision of what we keep and what we let go of. And the choice we make is most impacted by what we consider to be the win. Tiger Woods was the best golfer I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, he just kind of came onto the scene, won everything, rose to prominence. Uh, in fact, he was, so, he was so crucial early on, but before Jackson was born, my, my older brother-in-law, James, and I were talking about naming him Tiger. I never got approval on that, uh, but to this day, James calls Jackson Tiger. Uh, about 2010, Tiger's lack of integrity rose to the surface in his family life and, and many other things. And so a few years go by, and while 
His personal life didn't change much. He came back to prominence in golf, became the world number one again. Nike ran this ad, winning takes care of everything. And I found this old ad, which is really interesting. People were really up in arms about this. Does it? Does it take care of it? See, people seem to resist the idea, at least at some level, that morality and ethics and who you are as a person is trumped if you just win. But man, that's an uphill battle in this world, isn't it? I'll give you, give you another example here. Jeremy Affelt. I didn't think most of you would know him, and I realized he was a Rocky for a little while. Uh, he was a baseball player, and while playing for the Giants, a team that nobody likes, uh, he actually found out... Uh, that he was overpaid half a million dollars. Now, I, I know what I would, I would feel like if I was overpaid half a million dollars. Uh, to him, it was a minor error. Uh, but he went and he, he checked out what this looked like with three, like, you know, experts on the matter. He, he talked to the league. He talked to the Giants front office, even his own, his own agent. And they said, look, it, the contract can't be changed now. That overpayment is in your favor. You can, you can keep the money. And I found this really interesting. His agent, actually, Michael Moy, said to him, as your agent, I have to tell you that legally you can keep it. But as a man who represents integrity, I'm going to tell you you should give it back. And Jeremy actually happens to be a believer. And he said, no, I can't take this money. I wouldn't sleep well at night. Every time I saw my account, I would know that's not my money. And this is what I'm asking you about those two examples. Which one of those men would our culture say is winning? Where's, where's the integrity there? Remember, you decide every day what you're willing to let go of and what you're going to hold on to. And all of that is determined by what you think the win is. Joseph was willing to let go of his job, his reputation, his freedom, even his well-being. But he was not going to let go of his integrity because the win for Joseph was living a life that kept you close to God, even if it never looked like it to everybody else. He was clinging to God. One last thing about Joseph is he had an integrated incarceration. Now, we'll spend most of next week looking at this, uh, but I'll start it off this week in verses 20 through 23. While Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness. Notice the Lord was with him. And granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And so the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. And the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. That, does it not stand out at this point that wherever Joseph goes, he's pretty soon in charge of everything? Why? Because the person who fully trusts in God can be fully counted on. That's what you're seeing in the life of Joseph. Now, we'll, we'll finish up with his incarceration next week, but I just want to make a point to conclude today. Know this. The crisis of integrity in our world really is a, is a crisis of faith. That, that's the issue here. When our convictions change with a situation, when our ethics mold to whatever circumstance comes up, what that reveals is that the object of our faith is just too small. We're not looking at God anymore. See, Joseph did not put his hope in family. He did not put his hope in his occupation. He did not put his hope on a romantic relationship. Psalm 25, 21, may integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. Joseph lived a fully integrated life, and this kept him from disintegrating when things got hard. His hope was in God. And what Joseph learned, we all need to know, God was not just God in Canaan. God was still God in Egypt, and God was God at work, and God was God in relationships. Wherever you went, God was still on the throne, and I need everyone to hear this. God is not really your God anywhere if he's not your God everywhere. And that's what an integrated life looks like. When you have a hold on faith in God, you know other people start to put their faith in you. In my own walk, this is what happened. Those, those people you could count on and depend on who trusted God, they become mentors and guides to you. But ultimately, this is the point. They will point you to God himself and show you the joy of a life fully given to God. 
A person of integrity can be counted on and trusted in, dependable, and they will be a blessing to others. Proverbs 27, church, this is what I think all of our lives ought to become. The righteous man leaves a blameless life, but blessed are the children after him. You see, yeah, there's, there's a reason to have integrity for myself, for God, but it's something you leave behind in the end. There is no crisis that can steal your integrity. See, the crisis is when you surrender it, when you hand it over, or when you give it up. And Joseph is just going to keep continuing to teach us this kind of lesson. So we'll look more at his life, especially cover his jail time next week. Just want to say to those who are here, look, if you've not fully integrated your life with God, it starts with surrendering it all. God never asks for a tiny bitter piece. He wants your whole heart, your whole soul, your, your whole effort, everything you have. And when you've given that all to the Lord, you get back more than you could ever hope for. Life with him. Will life be easy? Nope. But it'll be walked with the Lord. That's something you, you just can't overestimate the value of. So if you're here today and you want to start your walk with God to be buried with Jesus Christ, let us know, and we'll take care of that right now. If you're here and you need our prayers, we want to encourage you to do that as well. We're about to sing a song uh, of invitation, and if something here gets you to think, you can come to the front, or you can talk to somebody in the back. But all we ask 